Good morning and welcome to our webinar on how to unravel the knotweed complex with genetics. My name is Matt Wallerath. I work with the Upper Sugar River Water State Association and I will be coordinating the data collection um, as far as the getting the information out and some of the data saved while my partner in crime, Nick Tippery, is going to be doing the genetic analysis and crunching the data as a professor, as he does. So we're going to trade off a little bit as we go down. Um, this is being recorded, so I ask again that please leave yourself muted and uh, cameras off. Ask questions in the chat. We'll get to that at the end. I want to make this something that we can use as a resource for our field crews. So um, quick background on this. This is going to be something that's been funded by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And we have funding for a bunch of samples for folks to do this work in the field. So we have money to, for Nick to get up to uh, 200 samples done by genetics. He's giving us kind of bulk rates. We have the ability to do a lot of that. The goal is to ideally get five samples per county uh, with the SISMA, then with the buffer based species management areas and other partners and each. So that would kind of get us maxed out, but we'll see what we can do. And maybe I'll might do more in my region. Um, we still are accepting uh, submissions of sites so this QR code and the form you see there is going to be how you can uh, sign up your sites to, to be in the, in the project. So that's going to be linking up your county, your sites and the name of them. Um, they have to be within 50 meters of either a wetland, a stream or a lake, but that's pretty easy. Most not we likes water, but we're trying to stay away from just like roadside or very, very terrestrial sites because this is going to be an aquatically funded as a surface water project. So you can, you can fill that out and that gets me that gets you on my list to get you this information um, in an email that's going to allow you to do have the protocol form that you can take into the field. It's going to allow you to get the appendixes that I mentioned that are the bits that we need to actually do to do the field work. So if you have not signed up yet, please do that and feel free to share that with other people. We are still accepting um, sites. And here's a bit about what we're going to cover today. So again, that's that same QR code. Um, things have changed a little bit um, as far as we're not doing the rate of spread quite as much. This was the, the original idea. So we have a slightly modified thing from how we did this in the, the um, scoping phase. If you're not familiar with knotweed, we're not going to get into it too much. We kind of assume you are if you're here, but, you know, it does punch through asphalt. It can take over the foundation of a house. I see it often spreading alongside the bits of infrastructure as they're being installed by contractors or often county municipality crews. And um, I'm teasing apart this bit here, which is to say, why do we care if it's not, if it's bohemian or if it's uh, giant or if it's Japanese? Well, we've found out that the hybrid, and if you look at this form here, is in fact quite more vigorous when it comes from regeneration, especially if the treatment um, by herbicide and general disturbance. So it's just we're dealing with a much nastier, um, a nastier thing that I think people really know. The Japanese knotweed that I think of when I, from my time practicing out in Washington state is male sterile. So it's a cultivar that doesn't reproduce by seed. And that's what we've labeled a lot of our stuff here in Wisconsin, but I think a lot more of it is hybrid than we really know. And so I'm going to let Nick uh, take over for a minute here and talk about his take on how he's going to tease this apart um and he's flying by the seat of his pants because he doesn't have my slides right in front of him but he's going to do a great job so here you're tightening up to nick with uh, a bit about the invasion here all right well thanks everybody for watching uh yeah so we have three entities the two are uh, proper species biological species the japanese knotweed and the giant knotweed uh, all of these are native to a rather narrow range in eastern asia uh, where they get their name is Japanese, and uh, the giant nutweed is called uh, Renutria sakalinensis. There's an island called Sakhalin north of Japan. So uh, they're native to that area. And then this thing we call Bohemian nutweed uh, is a hybrid. So that name explicitly tells you that it's a hybrid between the other two species. And uh, all of them, they have very similar invasion profiles here. So we have, uh, you can see in the uh, images that are up right now, um, as these are progressing through their invasions, the Japanese bohemian and giant knotweed all basically invaded the same areas around the same time. Uh, and they're all living in the very similar areas. So focusing on Wisconsin, we know we have Japanese knotweed, we know we have bohemian knotweed, we know we have 
uh, giant knotweed. And uh, a big part of this project is kind of equipping ourselves to make these, uh, maybe treat them differently. So in biological species, you might have a control agent that works against one species and doesn't work against another. Um, so having the tools to attack them specific to their genetics um, could become useful in the future. Uh, also just kind of reassuring to know what's out there um, as far as like how well they're going to spread by seed, for instance, things like that. So um, I think we can probably move on to the next one if you want. All right, so there's the uh, progression that was a movement through time uh, real briefly there. Uh, because they do hybridize, they're sometimes a little hard to tell apart. Uh, they're kind of cleaner differences on the, the far extreme. So here we have uh, from a document that's cited there, the top bar uh, of images are for Japanese knotweed, the bottom are for giant knotweed. Uh, I would say probably what most people use is uh, general size. So giant knotweed does earn its name. Those are much bigger leaves in general, uh, but also this leaf uh, basal lobes of the leaf blade. So on the left side there, uh, the Japanese knotweed has a characteristically truncate, uh, perfect right angle line going down the base of the leaf blade relative to the petiole or the leaf stalk. And then the uh, giant and bohemian have uh, lobes that are, are extending out more uh, relative to the rest of the leaf. So if you measure just the lobe, uh, one of the measurements we use is how long is that? Uh, we're using two centimeters or greater as a good indicator of giant knotweed. Um, I guess just to give yourself some comfort in the field, you're probably going to run into bohemian knotweed unless you already know you've got an area with giant knotweed uh, or Japanese knotweed. In Wisconsin, we're finding almost everything is some form of bohemian knotweed. Uh, apart from the leaves, you can look at the underside uh, veins. Sorry, go back one, Matt, please. Actually, we're not going to do the veins today. I don't, I don't All right, know. no veins. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah it's, it's, I find it hard to, to determine and they often fall off fall off by this time of the year anyways. So All right. I think uh, we're just going to drop that a bit. And make it okay. A little simpler for you. Yep, no worries. Uh, this, this map here shows data points and the identifications of the data points are by uh, whoever collected them or maybe someone was curating the data. Uh, and it, it's maybe not 100% accurate. So we have kind of pockets of giant knotweed in that rusty color, the, the orange color. Uh, pockets of bohemian knotweed in the green color, and then lots of reports of Japanese knotweed. I would say just this reflects the uh, most people's knowledge of this species group. They're probably familiar with what people would call Japanese knotweed. Um, and so th these are points that really need to be checked up again. And that's a big part of our project here is to go back in and say, okay, well, they might be Japanese knotweed. They could also be something else. So we're going to look at them genetically and use that as an independent way to identify them. All right, uh, map of the native range on the left there. I mentioned that before. Um, and then we've seen quite a few maps of the invaded range, invading range. You can go ahead. I just love this slide because it shows how these green dots are right on the edge and everything is blue. We call everything Japanese. And that's again, just teasing apart why we're doing this. Right, yeah. it's kind of a, a state uh, trend. I think people, yep. people within a state are probably using the same identification uh, criteria. And I think it's just that people haven't, um, maybe haven't concerned themselves with making that distinction between species. Uh, probably won't go through this too much. Just wanted to point out that uh, in, in publications that I like to use, the genus name for this is Renutria. You might have seen it by other names. Uh, Polygonum cuspidatum is on there, Fallopia japonica, and the same species you can see there with the equal sign. That's all names for Japanese knotweed. Um, and then on the right, there's just evidence to support the idea that we should call them Renutria. They're in a different group on the phylogeny than Fallopia. They're different from Polygonum. Um, they are their own thing. They're not many species in that group. And most of those are the ones that we are concerning ourselves with as invaders. So um, Japonica, Sakalinensis is the giant knotweed and so on. Um, so I, I teased a little bit earlier that we do have a lot of hybrids in the state. We're going to find mostly hybrids, I expect. Um, and what we'll get to is that we're finding different kinds of hybrids. And how we know that they're hybrids, uh, not just by looking at their morphology, is also because we can look at their genetics. And the genetics of a hybrid will show you a contribution from the male parent and a contribution from the female parent. Um, so to start with, this is kind of a, a background understanding where uh, one way to identify plants is to use DNA from their chloroplast or mitochondrion. 
Uh, and that shows only their maternal line of inheritance. So whoever contributed the uh, ovule, the, basically the seed parent, we like to call it, um, you can see only that one parent. So this actually doesn't tell you uh, whether a plant is a hybrid, but our updated data, uh, probably on the next slide, uh, shows that we can get evidence from both parents. So if you have a first generation hybrid between Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed, uh, what you should get in the nuclear DNA, the DNA of the nucleus, you should get a signature where you get half of that evidence showing you the male parents and half of that evidence, the female parent. So uh, males are contributing pollen in a fertilization event and females are, as I said, contributing the ovule and the female uh, parent ends up being the one where the seed is located uh, on the mature flowers. Um, so the chloroplast, as I said, only tells you really one parent of evidence. And so it doesn't show us hybrids, but it shows on here uh, the, the brightly colored G and J on there are the uh, invading populations of Japanese type chloroplast DNA and giant type chloroplast DNA. They're very distinct from each other. Uh, they're mixed in with a whole lot of variation from the native range. And that was rather simple. When you get to the data from the nucleus, uh, things get a lot more complicated. So we do find, this is kind of good, we're, we're getting lots of evidence about genetic variation in these hybrids. Uh, we get two kinds of Jap giant type uh, DNA sequence from the nucleus, uh, four types of Japanese type DNA from the nucleus, and all those lines connecting the colorful boxes, uh, those are indicating that the same individual has more than one kind of nuclear DNA. Uh, this is from a gene called leafy, and uh, that's kind of our, our uh, champion gene for this project. Um, so we can find out in one individual, does it have Japanese type? Does it have giant type? And even more than that, what kind of Japanese type and what kind of giant type? And we find, again, even within Wisconsin, uh, we found five different kinds of hybrids so far that have some combination of Japanese and giant parentage. So uh, as you can see on there, toward the bottom, all the ones that are labeled hybrid, uh, the J for Japanese and the G for giant, J1, G1 is a different genetic kind of hybrid than uh, J2, G2. And so coming back to what I said earlier, uh, these might be plants that need a different way to control them or, or have different ecological tolerances, uh, aggressive kinds of uh, reproduction or whatever we're looking at, they, they could be different. Uh, so if we're treating them all the same, we might not have the same effect of controlling them. Whereas if we understand that they're different and control them in different ways, uh, that can kind of increase the effectiveness of the tool set. Uh, so just a, a summary table here. This doesn't make a lot of sense even to me. It's just kind of pointing out that the traits we use to identify these in the field, um, the ones that are the plants that are true giant knotweed uh, have features that are consistently what you'd expect for giant knotweed. Uh, the plants that are what we think are pure Japanese knotweed have traits that are consistently those we expect for Japanese knotweed. Uh, and then the ones that are coming up as hybrid, again, most of the plants we found are some mix of features that kind of look like Japanese knotweed, kind of look like giant knotweed, uh, a lot of them somewhere in between. And uh, so from a, a genetic standpoint in an invasive species, this is a little troublesome, uh, indicates that there's a lot of variation and maybe lots of ways that these different plants can adapt to their local environments. And proof that we can't necessarily look at how they look by itself and determine what they are. Right. It's so much the same. Yeah. Okay, so uh, genetically, I mentioned the different Japanese type and giant type. Uh, this is one technique we have uh, in our toolkit is to be able to just run a relatively simple test, a PCR test, uh, can tell us uh, not necessarily which type of Japanese sequence or giant knotweed sequence, but it can tell us that we have uh, one or both of these contributions in an individual. Uh, we're actually kind of working on one of these that's more nuanced and we'll be able to tell out those different uh, Japanese types and giant types. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's the part we'll worry about and hopefully have something nice to report for you in the future. Okay, so um, one of the things as far as naming these plants, the plants we call uh, bohemian knotweed, they're not all the same. And I think a lot of times in species, uh, or at least in my experience, species often are very easily defined. Uh, even though there's a lot of variation across the range, you could say this is the DNA for this kind of species. 
Um, and we're finding a lot of differences within this Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, bohemian knotweed complex. Um, so we're kind of maybe looking for a way to give these more effective names in the future, but that's that's a work in progress too. Thanks, Nick. That was right. great. Again, it was me running slides that he didn't see, so well done. Um, yeah, and I, I'm going to propose a, a name here, uh, potentially with our paper that we're writing, and I'm not sure how to tease it apart, it's still in progress, but I love the name piercing knotweed, like the piercing knotweed complex. It both gets rid of the, uh, the name of any kind of person and implies some threat that is true of the plant. So, okay, let's get into the protocols here. Uh, the kind of the meat and potatoes, you might already know a lot of that. that that's the nice genetics background that we want to kind of impress upon you how we're actually doing this, what the, where the genetics come from. So that's all the methods we'll be using is Nick's protocol. And uh, so he's already been published on this in, 20, uh, in 2021. And we're looking at expanding his survey genetically with um, a couple other characteristics of the site. Pretty simple. That's why we knocked off, I knocked off the, uh, the hairs because that kind of requires a hand lens. It can be pretty cryptic. I have a hard time looking at it sometimes and I'm a decent botanist, I like to think. So we're instead going to do a different protocol. Um, so this is going to be what we're looking at. Um, now, you're going to be able to find all this stuff that I pull up um, in this drive folder so that you can be able to download stuff. So I'll also send out this presentation as a PDF. We should have clickable links. So you can, you can collect these things and slap them into your, uh, your browser and find this stuff. So I'm going to work through what we are talking about when we're talking about this protocol. And so this is going to be um, kind of the overview right here uh, as, we're, as we're coming through. And so we're going to be doing light leaf and flower visuals, leaf genetics, biodiversity, soil type, and the size of the patch are, are the kind of general ideas. So starting uh, with, with light here, um so this is my roommate chris who's a great well and biologist chris knoll uh repping it out and we're just going to go very very simple between full shade is zero part shade is one full sun is two this patch we're looking at it's partially in the shade it would get a one so trying to see real open sites versus generally speaking i think it's going to be a lot of ones maybe a few twos for full sun and so what we would do in that case is, I, is I, this form you did, you would just circle one of these puppies and just go from there. All right, um, now we've talked a bit about leaf and flower visuals already. Um, uh, Nick got into that, but we do have a nice guide available um, that has just, it's just those, those pictures that he laid out. So the truncate, very, very flat, small lobes or the giant lobes, that's gonna be our best thing for flowers, um, or for, for leaves rather. Now flowers, you'll notice if you remember briefly from that busy table, um, in general, we think of Japanese as being male sterile, meaning you do not see any male flowers. Um, there's a picture earlier of a really nice shot of some female flowers. So we, if you see males, check the box. If you see females, which you almost certainly will, check that box. If you see both, um, they're called, it's called demidioecious. So they do sometimes exhibit both types on one plant. Uh, but so look around for those, uh those male flowers that's not definitive but if we see them we know it's not the japanese type because that's going to be supposedly male sterile all right uh let's see so now we're going to go to uh size so a couple couple easy ways to do this um you know this is <laughs> this is the very advanced shovel technique in which you measure the size of your shovel and you lay it down across the patch bada bing bada boom you got yourself a length and then you do it for the width. So in this case, we're looking at the whole width, this whole stretch right here. So we counted this across with a, with a shovel. And then this is the middle point. And then we also did the width right here. So we want to record length and width. And now that's going to give us a general area that we can assess. There's also going to be a spot on the form for estimated size, because maybe the length and the width don't really capture it. The, the, the widest part is really much wider than the rest of it. Generally, they're kind of blob shaped. So we should be pretty, you know, we're not getting into geometry here, but um, you can definitely. Uh, look at it that way um or just get a tape measure out or a rope and measure it there's lots of, not, lots of ways to measure distance so have fun with that um we also will want to look at the tallest canes this one just got treated 
So we're going to say like three feet. I was just at another site yesterday, trusting these protocols. We saw some canes were like 16 feet tall. So um, we're also going to be checking out our flowers. Okay, like I, I mentioned earlier. So you can see we're just in time for the flowering season. Um, my, down here, they haven't quite busted open yet. We're about a week out of doing uh, collection. So just in time for all this stuff. Again, look for those male stamens. Um, and I'll shoot along a picture of a male stamen uh, in, in the documents too, just so we can kind of do a flower ID. Um, so now we're, while we're doing this, uh, we want to do our biodiversity check. So let me pull up my protocol again. So um, also a good time to, to grab, when you're right up in here looking at the flowers, is a good time to grab a collection uh, sample. So that's just going to be 18 inches of a healthy branch. Uh, somewhere kind of the, the general size about the right. And there's a whole protocol that uh, Nick made up um, for for this. So um, I, I can have, you can talk about shipping a little bit at the end here, just as far as what he prefers or pressing and whatnot, but uh, try to keep it simple for everybody. So the biodiversity index is something that my friend Jason Gramberg thought would be a cool thing to do, or I wanted to see. So we want to look at the diversity within a patch, meaning what's underneath the plant. Is there anything growing like inside the patches? And then how about five meters wider than the patch. So as you're doing your site analysis and your light and you're looking at your size, you got to keep a count. Now with this, it's very simple in that the diversity means distinct species. I don't expect you to know what the species are, but if they had a different looking leaf, then they count as a different species. So for this patch I was at yesterday, we found nine species in the patch and then 12 within five meters. Um, you can definitely go ahead and put in comments about the main species or what's growing next to it or around it or competing with it successfully. We'd love to know that in the comments section, but you don't need to do much more than just count distinct species in those two. So, you know, as you walk around within five meters, there's stuff under your feet. And what we're proving there is that the plants do seem to reduce, reduce biodiversity amongst themselves, either by shade or also just by alp, like they, they do poison roots to some extent. Um, so kind of combine those things. And then, um, yeah, leaf shape, we were talking all about that, you know, so you can see in this case, this looks like Japanese to me. So it's got that very slight uh, lobe, lobing, lobation, uh, lobe, I don't know, sir, I don't know, serration. Um, sinuses, those are called sinuses. It has very small sinuses um, right there. And so I'm also looking at the overall size um, and then the lift, leaf tape too, but uh, leaf tip right there. So, um, I record this as, you know, as a bohemian type. And in that case, I would go ahead and just circle, uh, let's see up here. I would circle with lobes, this one. Um, biodiversity kind of look like, there we go, stand up to there. Now we got our soil type um, too. Let me get going here. For collection, um, you know, like I said, 18 inches of kind of an average looking stock. Not the biggest, not the smallest. Um, and then uh, here we go for um, the uh, the soil sampling. So this is a very basic flow chart that's you know, I call it Appendix B. You basically you collect a bit of soil, you rub it in your hands, you add some water, and then you get these sandy loam, loam, silty loam, silty clay loam, clay loam, silty clay loam, sandy clay, clay, silty clay, sand or loamy sand. Yep, easy. But uh, it's really it's quite easy to uh, it's quite easy to do with your hands. So um, it's somewhat judged. You know, you can kind of judge it. It's, there's a little bit of discretion there. Um, we are looking also to do a, a GIS soil overlay at some point to see how we match up. Um, maybe these are sandier sites than the rest of the surrounding area. They seem to like, um, you know, sandy loam in particular, from my experience. So that's uh, that's when you would have to bring a little shovel out. Um, it's pretty easy to do, and it's kind of a fun thing. You can also teach science classes with. Um, and with that, I believe that is all the things that we were looking at. Um, I went out and did this, like I said yesterday, with all these things. So let's run them down. Light penetration, the one, two, three. Leaf and flower visuals. So we've got, how do they look for their leaf type? Do they have flowers? Leaf genetics, you uh, will follow appendix B, which is how um, we sample things. Sorry, this is soil is appendix C. Biodiversity index, soil type, and then the overall size of the patch. Um, I also do have in that folder and in, in online um, Nick's great paper, which I spelled his name wrong. Um, in the um, and so you can read more about the genetics and kind of the, the, the get into the gritty of it if you want to. There's also some great narrative there. 
Um, once this form is complete, so you can print this, it's only two pages, you can print this out and take it with you. That's right, one piece of paper, uh, front and back sides if you need to. Um, you will also want to print out the soil type thing at some point and potentially the um, the leaf the leaf shape, which is going to be, um, I think I've got too many petting bees. <laughs> uh, that's a, anyways. Um, so, uh, it, so that the idea is that you can, this is going to be a form that you can fill out online that has all these things as a drop down Google option. That makes my life a lot simpler as far as putting this into a data collection format. And so um, in this thing, we're going to want to have, you know, um, your site name here too, because you're going to be naming your sites. And um, that's going to sync up to the other form that you filled out to kind of enter the survey in the first place. Um, and with that, I am pretty, that's, that's, I took, it took me and my friend about 10 minutes, you know, to do everything, um, including walking around the diversity analysis. Uh, the soil sample was, was really easy because it was just sand. Um, but uh, so I would, um, I would say it's pretty quick to do. Um, we're, we're excited to have people get out there and start trying it. I'm going to get this all out in another, um, I, I'll blast this out today to this email list, um, maybe today or tomorrow, probably today, this afternoon. Um, so you'll have this ready to go. And um, when it comes down to shipping, um, I just want to mention that we are reimbursing for shipping costs. Um, so, and which mentions that, it mentioned in one of the forms. Um, so if you, uh, if you do want to get your uh, money reimbursed, so the, the science that Nick is doing is paid for by the state. You also have funds to reimburse your shipping costs. So just save a copy of that receipt. Maybe just like snap a picture of it and you send, like, send it along to me. And at the end of the season, we are going to go ahead and cut teeny checks to cover your, you know, your $10 of shipping or whatever it is. We want to make sure that's not on the burden to um, participation. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and um open it up to questions um anything anybody out there uh so now this is the moment if you want we're doing good on time so any any questions right now off the get-go i'm actually going to stop recording just to make this nice and short unless anyone has anyone, anyone julie go ahead hi yeah thank you for the presentation um i did plop it in the chat as well but we were just wondering the population that we were considering collecting samples from has been going undergoing active management throughout the year so we don't have any flowering individuals how would you recommend going about getting that information for that particular population on um i believe it was the flower sample or the flower information that you you referenced if you don't, you know, we're going to have a different N, I'm pretty sure, for all the different um, things that we're sampling. So not everyone's going to get a soil sample. Some people might not get a diversity sample. You might never see flowers. So I would just um, just don't check the boxes. And so we just won't see any flowers. Um, and that's going to give us a sign that it's being repressed. Um, but that's not a big deal. So just do it and just ignore that part of it. And if I, in the comment, this is a great thing. There's a comment section um on the form that you're sending in um and i should, in fact i'm gonna I'm, there's a comment section that's gonna be on the on the um drop down forms so that's a place good place to note that like um inactive treatment no flowers observed um now and the other thing i would say it's probably not possible but if you have anybody that's been around since this was started uh management and would happen to know you could ask them <laughs> that's an idea but i mean i, I it's pretty hard to tell um without really like look, looking pretty carefully if the flowers are male or female. I mean, once you get up there, it's fine, but it's not, you can't see it from the roadside if they're male or female. So um, I guess just don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, Go. thank yeah. you. you bet. Any other questions? All right. Um, big thanks to Dr. Nick for showing up, skipping out of some other faculty stuff to hang out with us today. And we look forward, um, you know, please feel free to email me with questions. Um, and I'll be reaching out from this list. And again, if you want to share these links and get more people involved, we are looking for good. We have not reached a max limit for any particular area yet. Um, so get those samples in and I'm looking forward to seeing what we find. Thank you again.
Thank you.